The science has been done. There's, there's, there's a guy called Stuart Hammerhoff at the University of Arizona, Professor Stuart Hammerhoff, and Britain's one of Britain's leading quantum uh, mathematical physicists, Sir Roger Penrose, the Rouse Ball Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge. These two guys have got together and they've come up with something called ORC OR, Orchestrated Objective Reduction. And this is an idea that consciousness is uploaded into the neurons of the brain through little tiny, little, tiny structures called microtubules. Now the reason, again, that Hammerhoff was interested in this stuff, he's, he's a professional anesthesiologist. And he is like all anesthesiologists. And I know because I work with one or two of them. I've got one guy who's working with me now, fascinating guy, the top anesthesiologist in, in, in London. They don't know how this works. They do not know how putting certain chemicals in the brain completely wipe out consciousness. They know the chemicals that work, mm -hmm. and they know how yeah. to administer them, but they don't know how. If you've ever had a general anaesthetic, mm. you know, you, you're there, injection goes in, and then you mm. come to. Mm. There is no intervening time, there's no dreaming sequence, there's no anything. Your consciousness is completely stopped. Mm. But you continue. The question is, what's taking place here? And I think this is, again, because all that's happening is the radio's being switched off. Mm. The chemicals have switched the radio off. You can no longer attune to the field. But that then begs the question, well, what are you? I had this feeling when, when I took DMT once that that, that what is this what we had? I just felt chemical. Oh, DMT. It just, I literally just felt, are we just chemicals? That's that kind yeah. of sense. Mm. I didn't, I, it, I was a little bit uncomfortable with it, to be honest, but that's kind do, of the feeling I, I got. I a lot of going through a lot of the DMT. Mm. And it puts up more questions than answers for me. Because if we're in, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think this is a, the whole thing is a simulation. Mm. Yeah. I, I think there's no other answer for it. Well, there is, but I, I believe it. So but when you go into the DMT, when you go to somewhere else, and you go, well, it, it's a changa I take rather than a full-on DMT. But when you go and you you're seeing something with your eyes shut, but I'm not looking through my eyes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Where's the light coming from? Where's everything mm. coming from? And the vibrations, mm. and, you can yeah. feel and the, the vibrations. Everybody's seen, yeah. everybody's seen yeah. the th same thing, they go into the same place. Yeah. And the question I was going to ask, which you'll probably have worked out long before me, if a guy has no eyes and he took the MT, mm. what would he be saying? They see. Yeah. And that's I it. Yeah. So yeah. what are you looking through? People, there have been evidence, there's a, 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 a lady called Umpeg, I think her name was, who was born blind, and she had a, now, uh, a near death experience, Vicky Umpeg, and she had a, a near death experience where she saw. Yeah. Mm. Now, what she saw is, is, is we, we can't really say, but she definitely said she could see things. Because she obviously she couldn't describe it, could she? She couldn't no, describe it because she's got no reference points. She's got no yeah. reference points. But clearly, there is, I mean, there's an associate of mine um, who works in Hungary. Um, it's Van Bocken, and Bocken is doing some fascinating work on um, biophotons. And biophotons are light that is given off by living cells. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of that, the biophotons themselves probably illuminates the environment you go into when you go into the DMT void. The idea that you are still seeing things, so it's clearly your visual systems are still being stimulated. Mm -hmm. And they do, they light up in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I work very closely with uh, two Austrian researchers, uh, Dr. Um, Engelbert Finkler and Dr. Dirk Prokop, who will have their machines with us at the Draco Caves. And they... They've That's the round... The, the Lucia, the Lucia yeah. hypnagogic life experience, light experience. And there's been research done at the University of uh, Sus sorry, uh, Sussex, down the road here in Brighton. Okay. And they actually had people using Lucia machines and they tested what was the firing up in their brains. And people took psilocybin, you know, magic mushrooms, yeah. and exactly the same areas of the brain they saw. Okay? Mm -hmm. So here we have evidence that you can reproduce what seems like an external reality internally. But then, there's the, for instance, I argue, when you have an out-of-the-body experience, when you lucid dream, there are shadows. There's a light mm -hmm. source. Mm -hmm. Where is the light source coming from? It's all internal. Mm -hmm. But then again, this is all internal. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, for instance, why do you know that this reality is real rather than your dream reality, rather than your DMT reality? And the only reason you believe it is because it's consensual. 
oh look, there is there is um, a load of cacti on there. Mm. And you agree with me. You say, yeah, there's a load of cacti yeah. on there. So you think, wow, we're in the same mm. place. But if you're part of my simulation, you'd say it's in the simulation as well. Mm. You'd say it in my dream. So that doesn't prove anything. But if we both go in a DMT situation and go to a place, see the same thing, come back, and in this reality, we both turn around and say, did you see that? Yeah. And I know people who've done that. Yeah. You know, it's about like such similar yeah. things. It might be more personal to them, but it's sort well, of... Well, that's it. But I'm going through this, like, on a psychonaut level, I like to go as hard as I can with it mm. and test it in different scenarios. Light with light, sound without... And you get a composite picture because obviously you can't come back and just reel off everything. Is no. but over a time, you're making a picture up. But when I hear so many familiar stories, yeah, and then not not everybody's living inside my head, but maybe we're all living inside a head, aren't we? Yeah. Which mm-hmm. being mm-hmm. well, it's thing. It's mm-hmm. like um, another of the guys that will be involved in the Draco Caves is is one of the um, uh, researchers involved. They're doing a, a massive DMT project at um, one of the London universities at the moment. And they have volunteers who have been taking DMT intravenously and reporting back. It's rather like the Rick Strassman work from the early 90s at the University of New Mexico. But they're doing it in London at the moment. And I spoke to this guy and he said it was really weird. It's really freaky, this. He turned around and he said that he he takes the DMT, it's out of his body, you know, as you crash out of yourself. And zoom, and you're in this place, and he's, he was in the, what's called the DMT cage. Yeah. It's kind of a kind of an enclosed area, which he said you could, you knew you were inside it, but you could see outside it as well, because of course you have omnivision in these circumstances. And he said, I'm in the cage, and then he said this entity comes over to the edge of the cage, and he goes, What are you doing here? You shouldn't <laughs> be doing this. This is the wrong way to do it. Do not do this again. And he goes, Whoa. and he's back. Here and he says, you know, one of the entities came over and said this, this is weird. Two weeks later, or whatever it was, he takes the DMT again, goes back, he's in the cage. The same creature comes up and he goes, I told you last time, do not do this. And he's saying to me, he said, What's that about? Mm. This being was waiting for me and remembered me and knew me mm. and was telling me off for doing something. Yeah, yeah. Now, surely if I'm creating this scenario, yes. The, the environment will support my position, mm, yep. not the opposite. Yeah. Mm. And I know other people you know that, that, that have had DMT experiences. People, particularly, have five meo DMT. Mm. You know, and they're in a really different ball game. There's a friend of mine that's still coming down a year later yeah, from his really five powerful, meo. Yeah. Well, they look like the terrified, don't they? they look <laughs> well, like he said it was just to die in the death a thousand times over, isn't it? Well, it is. And the thing is, you know, DMT and near death experiences. You know, I argue that they're all the same phenomenon. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, DMT is a near death experience in exactly the same shape or form. You know, it's just it's. And I am told, I mean, you can correct me on this, but people tell me when they take DMT, the reality they go to is much more real than this one. You know, you come back to this and you think, no, it's the other one. That's the real one. <laughs> that's, that's what, some people say it feels like home. Yeah, know? coming home. Yeah. Friend of mine, a friend yeah. of mine said this, a research uh, psychologist said this. He said the first time he took DMT, he ended up in this place. And although he felt he was coming home, he also felt, oh my God, I'm back there again. Oh. <laughs> and his sensation was, oh, no, not again. That's not nice. And it's the recognition of an environment that can be dangerous because we don't, we've no idea. My new book will be about entities. Mm. And when people come across entities in DMT experiences, when they come across entities uh, with alien encounters, when they come across greys and everything else, what does that mean? Mm. You know, I've, I've come across cases in my research that are uncanny, that link directly between ancient history and modern times, mm-hmm. you know. So, the, the, whatever is happening, I don't know if you know, they've, they've recently found some cave paintings that are 10,000 years old in, um, in northern India, underneath a village. Nobody's been there for 10,000 years. They've gone inside, the paintings are greys. Oh, black why? eyes, the whole thing. <laughs> and these cave paintings occur all around the world. Yeah. Now, is it just because people depict, is it a depiction because they don't know how to draw human beings? Well, they certainly knew how to draw bison. Yeah. They certainly knew how mm-hmm. to draw other animals. They're drawing mm-hmm. what they saw. They're drawing yeah. what they saw. And this is why I find it incredible that the archaeologists and people who are looking at these things don't see, well, <clears throat> they're not just idealised. It's theory, theory anthropes, I think, is what um, uh, Graham Hancock calls them. 
They're these kind of half-human creatures. Now, I know just how weird this is, because I've said this in other interviews, but a few years ago, there was something that took place in my mother's life, which still shakes me. It terrifies me, the implications of this. If you've not heard this, my mother phoned me up, phoned me up one evening, and she said she'd, she'd been walking home with my aunt onto the village they live on. And she said, your auntie Audrey had stopped to tie her shoelace. And my mother had stopped. Now, my mother's partially sighted. She, well, she was partially sighted. She's no longer with us now. And she'd lost one eye with malignant melanoma, and she had glaucoma in the other. But she said she looked over, over my aunt's head, and she saw over a local factory what she described as being a disc of, of smoke. And the disc started to spin and shot off towards North Wales. Mm -hmm. She said, what did I see? And I said, I really don't know. Well, maybe something to do with your sight or something else. She phoned me up two or three days later, one morning, absolutely in hysterics. She lives alone. My aunt had gone back. And she woke up in the middle of the night. She was in a state of sleep paralysis. She couldn't move and everything else. And we know sleep paralysis always has these strange effects. But she said she was looking towards the door and she knew the bedroom door she had closed the night before. It was about three o'clock in the morning. And the door was open. And then she said she looked at the door, and as she looked through the door, three spindly fingers came around the door, <laughs> and this little creature popped its head round, and it blinked at her and dodged back. She described, and this is her exact words, she said, Tony, what did I see? It had huge black eyes, it had two holes for, a ner for, for nostrils, and a slit for a mouth, and its head was pointed towards the end. And I said, I don't know, Mum. You know, I'm not sure what you did see there, you know. I've found in that state of sleep paralysis, because I've had a few out of body experiences, and I found that is like the perfect place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, people More panic. Aren't you, well, right? that is that, that's a yeah, nice place. That, that's when you know I could, yeah. but it's just figuring out, because when, when it's happened to me, it's something I wanted to do, but then I I couldn't do it, you know, then I tried, tried, tried for months, and then I thought, I can't do it, so I'll just let it go, and it kind of just happened on its own. Yeah. A few yeah. times, and it's that space, and I've heard voices in that space yeah, as well. Yeah. It, the actual technical term for that, if you're, which when you're going to sleep, it's called hypnagogia. Right. And when you're waking up, it's called hypnopompia. Right. Okay. And it's technically known as REM intrusion, in that you are awake and asleep at the same time. Yes. Yeah, so you're place. in this kind of liminal <laughs> area. And I get very strong hypnagogic images like yourself. And I always find that the images, you've got to pretend you're not seeing them, almost. Yeah. You've got to let them creep up on you. Yeah. And you've got to not be aware of them and then catch them. Yeah. And then catch them and look at them. I mean, the first time it happened to me, I was at work and I was, I was on my computer. And uh, I was suddenly, it's almost like here, I was looking, I was a creature underneath. Um, a, ch a, a glass table like this, and there's an elderly lady, and she's got a cup of coffee, and she puts the cup of coffee on the table. And I'm looking up, and you know, you think, what, what, what? And then you lose it. And then a week later, similar circumstances, I'm suddenly in a tree, looking down at an old man reading a newspaper. And I look up, and I'm in a square, there's this huge square, and there's an ambulance going around the corner of the square, and I can hear the sound of the ambulance, and I know it's somewhere in Latin America. And then, just like you say, you focus in on it and it disappears. Yeah. Now, what the hell is happening there? <laughs> this crazy. is not something I've thought, I would fancy being a little cat or I would fancy <laughs> being a bird in a tree looking at an old man reading a newspaper. Who is the person, who is the choreographer, who is the bricoleur, who is the person that puts these storylines mm. together for you? Mm. Who creates your dreams? Who is your dream mm. creator? When you have lucid dreams, well, who is he? Mm. Or who are they? Yeah, yeah. Is. you know, is it you to say it's your subconscious? Come on, mm. how can it be your subconscious? These things are embroidered. There's normally symbolism. Yeah. There's messages. Yeah. There's Jungian archetypes yeah. in there. You know, I, I for the first time became lucid in my dreams about three or four weeks ago. I've never ever become lucid before. Right. And I've been trying for years because I, I know a lot of top lucid dreamers. You know, Robert Wagner, Charlie Shaw, people like that. But it was the first time I was able to do it. And literally, I'd been in a nightclub, and I'd come out of a nightclub, and I was in an alleyway. And I don't know why, I suddenly became lucid in the dream. And I went, I'm dreaming, but I'm awake. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, what do I do now? And I thought, you know, they think, you fly. So what yeah. I did was, I lifted my feet up off the ground, and I fell to the floor. And I thought, that's not supposed to happen. <laughs> and then I tried it again, and I felt myself going up. 
And then I floated over the back of the alleyway, over a back wall. I can still see it in my mind's eye now. And I floated over the back wall. And then there's this huge, beautiful bay. It's in the middle of the night, and there's this beautiful bay. And there are lights along the side of the bay. And there are cars driving along them. And I fly towards them. And as I was saying to Charlie, I, I could feel the wind around me. And I was watching the cars, and then I lost it, and then I came too. Now, what was that? Where had I gone? It was real. Mm. There is no question, this wasn't a dream. This was a place I was seeing. Was I remote viewing? Was it a place, or was it your mind? Was it your brain? That, I don't know. I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you, for the reason of, well, no, go back to the DMT thing, and you come back and you go, I've got to go somewhere, because... My imagination can't be that yeah. good. Mm. But then if I hear that we're only using part of our brain, have I just tapped into another part of, of the network or whatever it is, and I've, I've just been inspired or I've, I've just downloaded something, and have we just created that thing, the whole dream? But even if you're downloading, it's still the question of the, the, the process that, that, that does that and how it works, how this reality can be so real. I mean, for instance, I know of people, somebody wrote to me a few years ago, you know the concept of false awakenings? Right. Okay, where well, you wake up, you go go to the bathroom, you clean something, uh, you wake, up, you again. wake up again. Yeah. One guy contacted me, and he'd done it eight times in the same day. He got to the middle of the afternoon the last time. And he looks out the windows, and it's dark, and he goes, it shouldn't be dark. So he goes, oh, God, I'm, a, I'm waking up again. And as he said to me, he said, how do I know that the last time I woke up, I was waking up. Oh, yeah. I've got no way of knowing. This could dream be within yeah. a dream, dream within, within a dream. dream. Mm. Yeah. Do you remember the sequence in uh, Inception? Yeah. You know where they're lucid yeah. dreaming in Inception, yeah. and the the bus is falling down it's and it's going and slower and slower. Lived a lifetime. So they go deeper and deeper into mm. the dream. Now, again, I, I wrote a book called The Labyrinth of Time about time perception and how time dilates under certain circumstances. Yeah. I think this is to do with the release of probably. I thought it was the neurotransmitter glutamate initially, I now believe it's endogenous DMT being released by the pineal gland. And I'll go on to that in a second because again, the neurology here is quite fascinating. But the idea that we, we can enter this timeless space, mm. orthogonal time that Philip K. D. called it, you know, this kind of space is where the time... moment of death at the time dilates in it? That's what I argue in mm. Cheating the Phone, yeah, that's yeah. what I argue with. The moment yeah. of death, time dilates mm. almost infinitely. Mm. So in which case, from your point of view, you will die. Yeah. From the point of view the of the observer, of the observer, you will yeah, die. Yeah, yeah. But for your point of view, you never get there. It's like Zeno's paradox. You never get to the point, the the the, rat, the, the hare never catches the tortoise mm -hmm. because you never get there. It's like you've already left your body before. Is that what you mean? Well, or? no, it's even more complex than um, that. It's the idea that your time, your speed of time slows down to such an extent that other people's time goes faster than you. Right. So you haven't even got to where they are in time. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've died here so you imagine you start to die here and you start to slow down somebody else's time moves like that mm. and you die here so they go past you and they see you die yeah. but you're yeah. still here right. what, happens happens to what happens to you after your death then uh that's the question <laughs> before your death i argue that this is where you fall into the simulation this is where the simulation is created this is where what i call cheating the ferryman where you live your life over and over again okay oh, constantly Co constant mm. oh, but, but different lives depending upon what you choose, choices you make in that life and what route you take. You know the analogy I was using before yeah, about yeah. Lara Croft? Yeah. Everything that you can do and every potential in your life is already encoded within the simulation. Not only that, but every outcome of the decision your parents made. Because your parents could have chosen to have emigrated to Australia. Mm -hmm. They could have emigrated to Greenland. You could have been brought up there. Your life would be completely different. So can we change this reality while we're in it? Yeah, we can. We're doing it all the time. Mm. Every time you make a decision, you change it. But do you have to put the, uh, also put an action behind that, or could you do it just with the physical mind? What do you do with like the physical mind? We've been talking on the way about yeah. manifest, uh, manifesting through thought, mm. yeah. things that you into your, want into to read. Yeah. But this is what... Donna it, seems to be really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you think about it. Think about it. Do you need all a all new pair of shoes? <laughs> I need one pair of new pair of shoes. She but I was talking about it. There's lots of different. I've tried lots of different ways using your sexual energy, using sigils. So many, but well, eventually they, they always do seem to. I said, obviously, the, the the further away the possibility, the longer it's going to take. So I always try my little things. I said, to and girls. <laughs> well, this is it. This is what it. they do eventually come. Well, this is all the time we are we are continually 
recreating our reality. Mm. Now, for instance, there's an argument in quantum physics, which is really in vogue at the moment, is that time is quantized mm. in exactly the same way. Now, if time is quantized, that means that every moment the universe is recreated again. It means there is actual this bit of time and that bit of time with a gap in between where there is nothing. So it's just recreated time after time mm. after yeah. time. Your act of observation, your, your anticipations of what you see around you, you manifest it. I know, for instance, I'm a very pessimistic person. I know that things won't work out for me, and they won't. They don't. I mean, I've been saying for weeks, you know, to, to, to friends I know, you know, something weird is going to happen on my birthday. April the 12th, Brexit. You know, I didn't know that months ago. Yeah. You know, these kind of things. It's as if we just... If you're feeling positive, there was a friend of mine who uh, I met in Switzerland many years ago. He said he went through this period, and he said he used to drive round, and he, it was only one day where he saw a red light. He thought, Jesus. Yeah, I get that all the time. I, I, I haven't seen a red light for and weeks. I, I found this sort of inner peace that I can yeah. tap into now. Go with the flow. Yeah, yeah, and I can sort of recreate this feeling. So why don't you do that? Yeah. Why, don't, why do you live a life of pessimism if you know that you can create... Yeah. A, a positive I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I enjoy the pessimism. Maybe, maybe I like being disappointed. I don't know. It's it's weird. It's yeah. probably just the way I am. Um, but you know, optimistic people. You know, things happen for them in 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 positive ways. And I, I just think it's because your daemon is saying. Because the thing is, as well, if you if you believe in the daemon hypothesis, the game player who's guiding you. Mm. It knows the out the future outcomes of your decisions. Yeah. So what might seem at the moment like a really bad decision yeah. actually pans out yeah, well. To be good. It's just it's he's getting you from A to G, A to A to Z, and you're going from A to B. But the daemon knows I've got to get him here. Like losing a job, you think, oh no, I've lost my job. What am I going to do? Yeah. But then really, yeah. it's it's going to see to get this better job that's meant yeah. for you you need to you know but you don't always see oh, it do you yeah because you so know, what do you think about it. synchronicity how do you think oh. that fits in because i get that quite yeah. a lot synchronicity is absolutely fascinating again wolfgang pauli pauli exclusion principle mm -hmm. that i talked about before mm -hmm. wolfgang pauli one of the top quantum physicists in the 1930s also was fascinated by synchronicity he worked with Carl gustav jung and wrote a book on synchronicity mm -hmm. on it Synchronicity are significant coincidences. These are coincidences that are rooted and have significance. Mm. And we see them in our lives all the time. Now, the skeptics would turn around and say, it's confirmation mm. bias. Mm. It's yeah. anticipation bias. Yeah. You're looking for the coincidences. Yeah. Come on. How, how statistically, how many coincidences can take place? I've had things yeah. like sort of four or five seemingly diff not connected things like radio, my phone, a car going past with a yeah. word on it, a van, all come together in one moment. But it's not just that, it's the feeling that you get with it mm. as well. It's oh, like, yeah. The acknowledgement, mm. if you acknowledge it, it's, yeah. it's like... And it's like all in one moment, and it's mm. quite I, amazing. I get it, I get it. Oh, yeah, it is, it always is. It's, 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 it's the thing. jokes. Mm. Yeah. It's the Those jokes. Are the <laughs> right, you, go, yeah. you go, oh, ha, oh, ha, oh, yeah, right, I get it now. <laughs> and that happens to me so often, you know, you, you think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're being funny, aren't you? <laughs> and it does happen. I mean, I've had so many of them happen during my writings and everything else as well. I'm absolutely convinced. I'm convinced that, that you know there is something taking place here. And I think maybe it is Damon influence. Maybe maybe it's the Damon just brings these little clues into your life to say because they say, don't they? Coincidences, deja vu, sensations. Yeah. These are all for nature to tell you mm. you're on the right track. Yeah. Mm. And that I means, used to mm. get it with book. You know, when I first started waking up to new things, I used to sort of. I just wanted to know everything, so I'd be reading so many different books at one point and, and watching all these different videos. I'd have so much on the go, and I'd sort of like go through my normal day, and I'd, I'd have like a realisation throughout the day, like an epiphany, like, oh, you know, that would sort of stun me. And then I'd sort of go home later on, and I'd start, I'd pick a random book or a random video that I've been watching, and it would seem to talk about that realisation, mm. almost like it would confirm what I'd realised. So I would realise him first, and then other people were confirming it was like, wow. Because your whole day is set up for you, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. It's because this is, this is your simulation. It's your yeah. simulation. Everything is for your advantage. Yeah. So, you know, you meet people. You meet people that you, you know you know them. Yeah. Mm. You know, there's somebody recently I've been, you know, come across and we both agreed that we, know, we knew each other. We know mm. each other. We knew, we recognised each other straight away. And it's that kind of weird, well, you're going to be significant in my life. What do you, how? Yeah. Mm. You know, these kind of things. That's what we are now. Yeah. That's exactly what we are. Yeah. I met these guys just over a year, 
Like, yeah, that's that's you so many years ago. Yeah. And they saw something in me, I saw... These two are like a double act. These, if you watch yeah, the old good. videos, they're good. They're the best. Nice, nice, the simple line. Going. <laughs> and I'm louder and brasher and all the rest. And Which what like, we need as well, though, isn't it? So they <laughs> went. <laughs> yeah, they yeah, went so yeah. when we met, we were like kindred spirits, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you yeah. do. You meet people, mm. and the amount of people I've met since I've written my books, I've got such great friends. Yeah. Mm. Massively fantastic mm. supporting friends from across the world. Mm. And it's so great because you, you realise that there are people out here that have extraordinary experiences and want to understand. Mm, yes. You yeah. know, it doesn't mean that we're, <coughs> we're being stupid or we're being silly. We've had these things happen to yeah. us. Mm. And it makes you question. Yeah. And mm. it questions in a positive way. You know, that's, nobody's trying to manipulate. Yeah, that's right. Mm. You know? Nobody's trying to make you pray to God or no. pray to this on or the contrary, worship. It's, on the contrary, yeah. it's, we're it's just saying, my books, that's go that's away, yeah. read, read the yeah. articles, yeah. read yeah. the books, yeah. don't take my word for it. I'm yeah. not a guru, I'm just an ordinary yeah. guy. Yeah. You know, um, and that's what shakes my tree. This is why I do it. And this is why And then I'm you understand it. you can let all the negative people out of your life. Yeah. That just mm. seems to happen. I think once you raise that that your positive yeah. vibration. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Them all drop it away, but you might have people in your family that it's, oh yeah. But yeah. then you look and you go, all they ever do is I'll come up with something and they've got an anti argument to it. Yeah. They just yeah, want to you, you, you don't need this. Mm. You don't need any of that. If you fill your whole life with positive things, mm. you don't have to be airy fairy and walk around with your head in the trees. But you can create a beautiful thing, can't you? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, shit's gonna happen. It's always gonna happen, isn't yeah. it? That's you just you, you live with it and think, well, you know, this is this is all I mean I find, you know, there's um, Abraham Maslow. You heard of Maslow, the peak experience? Yeah, yeah. The hierarchy of needs. You know, you know, I'm 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 existing in literally and metaphorically the peak experience with my surname as well. You know, yeah. it's um I just feel self actualized. I feel I am where I want to be. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be anywhere else. I if I become more famous, fine. If I don't, I don't I don't really care. Yeah. To me that doesn't matter. What matters is doing this mm -hmm. and getting the thrill and the sheer enjoyment mm. of meeting people mm. like you and swapping ideas, yeah. bouncing ideas off the wall and thinking things through. Yeah. This is what we're here to do, mm. we're here to learn.